welcome to Women in WP, a bi-monthly podcast about women who blog, design, develop, and more in the WordPress community. Hey, Women in WP listeners. Before we get to the show, we quickly want to tell you about a great opportunity. One of our favorite plugins, WP All Import, is looking to hire a customer support representative. The position is 30 hours a week, $30 an hour, completely remote and has a flexible schedule. WP All Import started in 2011 and now has grown to a great team of people distributed all over the world. And they support over 12,000 customers across the globe. This position is in English and requires some technical know-how. Check out all the job requirements and detailed instructions on how to apply at wpallimport.com slash hiring. Go apply and then let them know that Women in WP sent you. Now let's get to our show. Welcome to the show. I'm Angela Bowman. I'm Tracy Epps. And I'm Amy Masson. Our guest today is Francesco Marano, who is WordPress Community Manager with SiteGround and a WordPress Core Community Contributor. Hello, everyone. Buonasera. If you've listened to this show before, you know we like to start off each episode by asking our guests about their journey into WordPress. How did you get started? So, um, in WordPress as a software, uh, I started using it um, in 2008. I built myself a, a mommy blog. My son was two years old, and I thought the whole world needed to see his pictures, of course, a very, you know, like it would normal. And then I moved to WordPress.org because I he didn't want to model for me anymore so much. So I found that tweaking the website was also a lot of fun to keep myself busy. And, uh, and I started tweaking my website. I started tweaking my blog. And um, to my big surprise, people asked me to do the same for them. And they were also ready to pay me for that. So that's how my career as a WordPress professional started. Um, it was a lot of trial and error, I must say. And, um, but it was also a lot of fun because I worked with a lot of women that were also transitioning from uh, back to a professional life after having, having kids. So it was a very, very specific niche, and I really enjoyed working with, with them. So that's how I started. And when you – so I also had a mommy blog. Um, that I, because everybody, of course, wanted to see pictures of, of my babies. Of course. Um, of course. So when you first started transitioning into getting paying work from people, what kind of jobs were they? What kind of websites were they? Everything. I took everything. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I, first of all, my life at the time, I was working as an administrative manager. So, you know, being a freelancer was very far from my day-to-day -day life and and because also I didn't really have many skills I felt a bit weird getting paid for this uh, but actually because I, 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 I did actually have some pre-existing skills because I took CSS and HTML classes like 10 years before so actually the products were not too bad but at the beginning I was really really not just focused on making uh, WordPress website so you know if you came to me and be like hey can you also do my logo I would be like sure because I did two years of graphic design or can you can you uh, manage my social media well why not you know so I took a little bit of everything and it took me a while to transition out of this phase of uh, doing everything and also doing everything for cheap to be honest um, so it took me a couple of years to to raise my profile a little bit more. Uh, it was a bit easier at the time. We're talking about 10 years ago because um, there weren't many, as many WordPress. So after I quit my mommy blog, I started blogging about my job and I started blogging about WordPress. And at the time, there weren't many uh, blogs about WordPress in Italy, at least. And basically, none of them were run by uh, 
a woman. <laughs> so it was it was a bit easier for me than at the time to, to change and improve because I was very visible in that specific niche that I picked. And also my skills got better. So I was able, you know, with, in time and to to ask for more money, to say no to more words that I, I, I said yes to. And, but at the beginning, I really took everything. <laughs> I feel like I had a very similar journey where I just was like, well, yeah, I'll do that too. And I'll do that. And I'll do that, whatever. Um, and you are organizing, because we've talked a little bit about this WordPress release um, and heading that up. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this? So that was also, I think all these things kind of happened in my life without me really looking <laughs> to make those changes, which is probably great because it takes away a lot of the pressure from, you know, I have to decide on something, I have to do something. So basically in the same way that I started becoming a WordPress website maker, I became a, a WordPress contributor by giving a talk about uh, websites for freelancers at a freelancing event in 2015, something like that. And in the audience, there was someone that um, was already contributing to WordPress. So I was like, okay, so you seem to know stuff about WordPress. Why don't you contribute to it? I'm like, because I'm not a developer. And I was like, ah, oh, again, with the story of the developers. It's not that only developers can uh, contribute to WordPress. At the time, there were already like 14 teams. And I was like, why don't you start with translations? Which, you know, doesn't require um, a, a difficult setup. It doesn't really... It requires you to want to make the product better for everyone who's using it. So that was my mindset anyway. So I started, um, I started translating uh, WordPress into Italian. Now, at the time, Italy didn't really have a community. And uh, so the very few people that contributed to WordPress and, you know, wrote the on the blogs and stuff like that, we all kind of knew each other. And so on the same summer, we decided that now that we had one person contributing to polyglots, one person contributing to core, one person contributing, like five people, we were a community and we needed to become bigger. So we started organizing things and uh, we organized the contributor day and that's how we got a lot of new people on board and then the year after that uh, we organized work in torino which was the first which is my hometown and it was the first uh word camp in italy uh, for like three four years i can't remember and then i switched so I went from polyglots to community and I started being a community organizer, organizing the meetup in my hometown, organizing the work camp. And then I wanted to do more. So I um, volunteered for the community team as, a, um, as an active member, which we call deputies, which is a very American thing that I basically never heard of before. Um, <laughs> so, but I got the, I got the gist after they explained to me what I was supposed to do. <laughs> so I started, um, you know, vetting application, being present during the meetings. And I started working very closely with Andrea Middleton and Josefa Hayden. And, um, and about a year ago, I would say, Core started reaching out to all the, all the other teams and say, hey, we want to increase the diversity of Core because we don't want just uh, developers and only male developers being involved in this. Also because um, a release is kind of a big process and we need all sorts of skills. So is, is there anyone there in any of your team wanting to contribute, uh, you know, in any capacity to a minor release? And I was like, Sure, why not? <laughs> you know, I mean, I kind of expected to start with a minor release. And then I don't know how I became the co-lead of a major release. <laughs> Isn't that what every woman could say at some point in their life? <laughs> I mean, it kind of, it, so for months it was like, okay, you know, and every once in a while I was popping into core and I was like, 
I, I'm still fine doing a minor release if you need me. And they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're putting together the next one, the next one. And then it didn't align. And then Josefa just pinged me and say, and what if it was a major instead of a minor? <laughs> and you get a lot of support and you have an amazing team. And then I was like, I mean, I trust this woman. She taught me a lot uh, regarding the community team and the community, the, the workers community that is obviously not just the community team. So I'm going to say yes. And that's how I did it. And, um, and then somehow I also found myself doing another one after that. <laughs> and, uh, but now I'm done. <laughs> well, this is a recurring theme we've always seen with uh, like people like, women we we like oh well there's a need here so we just, we just, we just yeah do it. yeah but to be fair i think so it's um it's a lot less stressful than i think people imagine it to be because it is a big team so up until 5.0 5.1 i can't remember basically there was one release lead a deputy again apparently were very fond of this work <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know there was a like some co-lead but the teams were like two three and for 5.3 I think we were uh, I want to say 15 probably we were a bit less and everyone was very focused on something specific so it was not one person having to keep an eye on everything but everyone keeping an eye on their thing, cross-communicating, of course, and collaborating. And then my role as the coordinator was basically to get the information from everyone and, you know, see if there were any roadblocks, if there were uh, some things that weren't going as planned, if there was something that needed a bit more help, more eyes. Uh, and then some admin stuff like posting the agenda for the weekly chat and hosting the weekly chat and stuff like that. Um, but honestly, there's a lot of support. So this is why also I, I did also the second one, 5.4, because I knew that not only there was all the support, I could also learn more to be, my, to be myself a support for someone else uh, in the upcoming future. Uh, Tracy knows it because I pinged her about it. <laughs> uh, so um, it has been... Um, advertised by Josefa that 5.6, which is the last release of 2020, will be um, uh, female only. No, I don't want to say female only. Female-led release. Um, so we are working. Now, I won't be coordinating the releases, but I will keep working with CORE uh, to, to make this possible. And so we're starting now working on 5.5, but we're already moving forward with 5.6 because we want all the women that will be involved in that to ride along 5.5 uh, and see how things are going and see if it fits them, if they want to do it. And I hope they want. We had an amazing response to this. Like we got 90 people pinged us and said, yes, I'm interested. And it was like, now we, we have the opposite problem. We have too many people, so we have to think how to organize this, but it's never enough. I mean, the more the merrier, I think. So that's how I went from mummy blogger to release co-lead, basically. Well, there's always this, you know, oh, you're a core contributor if you, if you contribute code. But the, like you said, when you're trying to co you like organize that many people, I can't even imagine doing that. Like that to me is way beyond my skill set. And, but so like that is very valuable. And so I just, I wish we had, could change, we change. I think it is changing. It's starting to change this mindset of no, it's every single piece is just as important as every other piece. So everything should be celebrated at, and, and rewarded as much. So actually everyone is kind of already on board with that. It's just me being very um, uncomfortable with compliments and being very uncomfortable with the roles that I'm not 100% sure I'm 
really good at. So, you know, there is this um, interesting... Spoiler alert, you are. (laughs) But, you know, there is this very interesting article that you're probably all familiar with from the... um, uh, Harvard Business Review that says that uh, men applies to job uh, if they have like 20% of the <laughs> requirement and uh, women wait to have at least like 95%. So, yeah, it's true. Or you've se- I've seen it on Twitter, like, okay, to balance it out, men apply for something below what you would, women apply for something above what you would. Yeah, and the other thing is that it's very common for women to underplay our wins. And um, so actually everyone in the core team treats me as a core contributor. I'm the one that has a hard time (laughs) believing that I'm a core contributor to the CMS that is most (laughs) widely (laughs) used in the world. I think I'm also trying to downplay it a little bit so I don't feel the pressure too much and the responsibilities. I'm like... No, I'm not really doing anything, you know, I'm just asking people for a status report because then when I go to the counter and I see, like when we launched 5.4, we were like um, something like less than 300,000 installs away from 50 million installs of WordPress. So I have to you know, not think about that too much. <laughs> so I'm like, no, I'm just there to help a little bit. It's, you know. Well, you said, you know, oh, it's just me. Everybody else is, is you know, fine with it. But I just don't think that's true. I have been to every single WordCamp US that there have we have had, and I have not once attended a contributor day. And I think a lot of that has to do with feeling like, you know, oh, I'm not a, you know, a, coder or programmer to that level. And I don't, you know, I, I would be, you know, a, a fake, I'd be a fraud. And so I just haven't gone. So it's not just you. Yeah. So it's funny because actually WordPress, uh, the, the, um, let's say the contributor experience is made up of something like 18 teams right now. And I think just half of them require you to know how to develop. All the others don't really need it. There's a, you know, there's the community team where basically uh, you have to be willing to grow your local community. That's basically the people that contribute to community to that. And then there is, for example, marketing. So, you know, if you have any interest in copywriting, promoting and anything like marketing in the very big and wide sense, you can contribute to that. There is training, which is a team that I think doesn't get enough visibility. At least I don't see it in my radar so much. And it's a shame because the training team, for example, what they do, they put together a study plan, lesson plans for people that want to teach WordPress. So it's so valuable. Like, you know, next time you can teach that in, in your community, in your kids' school, whatever. And, and the test team is that needs a lot of help in testing stuff. And then there's the documentation, which is also doesn't require you to be a developer. So there are so many opportunities. And the documentation, it help, I feel like it helps if you're not a developer because I've read the documentation where it's written for, you know, from that lens where I'm like, I don't know where this, this I don't understand any of this. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Design is also an amazing team because it's very, very much about um, different skills. So design is made of UX people, UI people, uh, graphic designers, developers, front-end developers, uh, you know, it, it really, really brings a lot of skills together. So I think, so... Um, Work in Europe is going to be um, a virtual event this year. And um, up until a month ago, I was uh, part of the team um, and I was actually in charge of uh, the team that was organizing Contributor Day. Then when we decided to move to virtual, because also of the situation in Italy, I opted out for from the organizing team because I, it's 
kind of hard right now to keep up with everything. So Timi, um, I cannot pronounce his last name because he's from Finland, so it's basically impossible uh, for anyone who's not Finnish to say his last name, but look for Sipis, Timi. He's in the community team, he's taking over, and he's organizing a contributor day, um, a virtual contributor day. And I think it's going to be so interesting because... Um, probably it's going to be a good occasion to onboard the people that might feel a bit out of place at a contributor day at work in PUS because, you know, there are also all the big names, all the big shot developers. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm just a girl from Italy, so I don't really fit in. But actually, and that's also another thing, this is also self-inflicted because no one ever made me feel out of place in any of the contributor days I ever attended or, you know, every, any WordCamp or any team where I just pinged and say, hey, I need some help with this thing. Um, so this is really self-inflicted and we should probably stop doing it. <laughs> so Amy, please sign up for the virtual contributor day at work in Europe. And I promise you that once the contributing bug hits you, then actually you have a problem because you will want to contribute a lot more than you are able to. <laughs> that is 100% it. I went to the contributor day in Philadelphia and it was my first word camp US and I have a hard time with the big conferences. Like I feel like I'm trying to make a connection and often, you know, like with that, I didn't, I knew some people and I was there with some people, but I tend to, after that full day, just want to go cry. <laughs> it's interesting. And so that morning of contributor day, I was just crying and I'm like, oh, I don't want to go, but I was just going to make myself go. Cause I just felt like, okay, I don't want to just leave this conference in tears and um, it's just a weird thing. And maybe it's more that I'm a little more introverted than I'm ever willing to acknowledge. So I went to Contributor Day and I was so nervous. And I went on to Julie Cole's training team, the one you're saying doesn't get enough attention. And I'll tell you what, it is much easier to go to Contributor Day than to the big conference because you sit at a table with maybe eight or 10 or 12 people. They're now all your new best friends. Some of them might even be somewhat famous. And then they're like one guy who just went through a rough time. He was practically in tears. And he's someone who's super famous. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's having a crisis right now. And it's just so humanizing and so community building. And you're right. The, pro the challenge isn't so much that you're going to feel like you don't belong. The challenge is it's like, you know, like a contagion, like you just get this bug and you're like, I can't shake it. Now, it's like being roped into the mafia or something. Like <laughs> You're put on a Slack channel. <laughs> you are so sucked in. It's like they're looking for warm bodies. <laughs> it's a Ponzi scheme. I always say it. It's like bring a friend <laughs> and then give them some work. <laughs> Hi, Women in WP listeners. This is Angela with a quick note from our sponsor, Malcare. The thing I like most about Malcare is how simple it is to use. Unlike other security plugins that have an array of confusing options that you have to figure out whether or not to turn on and if they will break your site, is you simply install and activate Malcare. That's it. It blocks brute force attacks to your site instantly and protects your site with a firewall. Regular security plugins are quite resource intensive because if they provide any sort of scanning, the scanning happens directly on your hosting server, which can really slow down your site. Malcare, on the other hand, copies your site encrypted to their dedicated cloud servers. So all of the scanning processes occur in the cloud, ensuring that Malcare never impacts the performance of your site. Malcare's regular deep clean scanning of your files and database can dynamically detect even the most complex malware. This ensures that you're the first to know if your site or client site has been hacked. Using Malcare's one-click instant removal tool makes your site malware free in minutes at a fraction of the price of other security services. To get started with Malcare and take advantage of their expert team of security support, please visit malcare.com women in WP for 10% off your first year of protection or see the show notes for a link. Now back to the show. Well, we were, all three of us were planning to be at WordCamp Europe this year, and I was very excited. And so 
Um, of course, we're all very sad about not being able to go to Europe. And so I would like to, it's not WordPress related, but find out more about what life in Italy is like right now. I know we used to hear a lot about Italy right when things were starting to get crazy here. And then now the news isn't reporting on Italy at all. And so I just feel like we're not really hearing about anything about how things are around the world. We're only hearing about what, it, what it's like here. And I really want to know what Italy is like right now. Yeah, I think that's very common in every country, by the way. When this all started uh, at the end of 2019 in China, you know, it was like, oh, it's far away, but also the scale is so massive, but we're so far from that. So, you know, it kind of, it's, it's not really your problem in a way. And then when it got to Italy, because Italy was the first country outside of China that was hit very hard, then of course, you know, it was news because no one else at the same time was hit as hard. Unfortunately, from then, <laughs> a lot of things have changed. And now the US are actually the, the most um, affected uh, country in the world. We're number one. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Mm. And Spain, which was kind of... Spain is very, very, very worrisome because at the beginning they were like two weeks behind us, but now not only they caught up with us, but they are also went over our numbers. So, so the situation in Italy, unfortunately, is the same. <laughs> so um, we are still in lockdown. Uh, we started, well, personally, I put myself in self-isolation at the beginning of March uh, because things were starting to look really scary and uh, I didn't need uh, the government to tell me to be careful. Uh, and then basically a couple of 10 days after that, actually the government had to you know, intervene and tell everyone to stay home. So right now we're really locked in. Uh, we're allowed to leave the house to um, to buy groceries for necessities. So if I have to go to a, a medical appointment or if I have to go to the pharmacy or, you know, a bulb explodes, then I, I am allowed to go. We we are not allowed to go into parks, which is, I think, the hardest part because, um, especially for teenagers, I have a 14 year old son and he's, you know, really, really not enjoying this uh, continuous uh, <laughs> lockdown in the house. I am, honestly, I don't mind it. I've been working from home for 10 years. So I'm used to my universe being as big as this bedroom, basically, <laughs> except for when I'm going to conferences. That's basically my life is either being by myself in my home or going to conferences with other hundreds of people. So in terms of how the, my everyday life has been affected is not. But at the same time, there is a nagging feeling behind you that says, oh, do I need to go out for milk? Really? Because I, personally, I am scared. And I think a lot of people are scared because the, the growth is exponential and there's a lot of people without symptoms. So, you know, you it kind of feels a little bit like, okay, I'm going to get the milk, but maybe I'm coming back with something else as well. Numbers are very uneven. We cannot, and this is, I think, a problem that a lot of uh, countries have, but in Italy, actually something that has been discussed uh, heavily in the last few days. Uh, we don't actually know how many people have been affected because we do the... Um, how do you call the exam? The 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 exam that they do. Oh, the swab, the swab, the swab, the swab, swab. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we call it tampon for some reason, which is tampon. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just it's a cotton, it's a cotton swab. No, but actually they do a blood exam, but they still call it tampon. I don't know why, but anyway. So, uh, so it turns out that uh, there's a big problem with nursing homes. This is what you call uh, the places where 
um, yes. elderly can yeah. live. So there's a big problem because high mortality rate, but because they didn't do the test to to everyone, you know, some deaths has been have been marked as non coronavirus related, but they are. So it's not clear. It's not very clear what the real numbers are. How accessible are tests to you? Like if you started not coughing, at not at all. So, not at all. Because as Americans, we're really pissed off right now at our government blaming them that we don't have tests, but it's good to hear from other people their experience. So we also test only people that have symptoms and only people that have like a lot of them. So, for example, if I had a fever right now and I would call the number that we're supposed to call, they would be like, oh, keep checking how's going on. And if you also develop a cough and if how is it going tomorrow and stuff like that. So um, actually get tested basically when it's 99 percent sure that you have coronavirus. Yeah, like here you have to be hospitalized, admitted to the hospital before you'll get a test. And my friend just got over COVID and they wouldn't test her because she wasn't hospitalized. She had, she could manage yeah, that's it. At also, home. No, no, we can get tested um, also if we're not hospitalized, but, but it's still not really readily available. There are some regions, Italy is divided in regions, so we don't have a, like a federal government like you do, but um, regions do have some autonomy uh, on certain matters. So for example, Veneto, which is the region um, completely east of Italy where Venice is, uh, they are now uh, trying to, to test more heavily uh, and widely so they can catch more people because that's exactly the problem that a lot of people don't have any symptoms so you know we keep our lives and um and despite the fact for example that i'm being self-isolating for over six weeks now i still go to the supermarket once a week so if i'm asymptomatic i could be spreading that without even knowing it the, the difference, I think the main difference with the U.S. is that our national um, health system is public. So once you, you do think that you have this, you will go to the hospital and seek for treatment because you're not afraid that this will cost you too much. What's amazing is I'm on a plan that is um, an HMO in Colorado called Kaiser Permanente. And they sent an email to all of us saying that they will cover all coronavirus testing as well as treatment for free, and it will not hit our deductible or copays, which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, that is not the case for me. Me either. I mean, it's, and that's one of the things I complain about with our healthcare system is, you know, this is going to be perpetuated for for people that have really shitty insurance like I do, because if I got it, I wouldn't go to the doctor. Yeah. I wouldn't go get tested because how much is that going to cost me? How much is treatment going to cost me? Can I just write it out at home while I am also in turn spreading it to people around me? It's a public health problem. And, you know, I can afford to go to the doctor, but my insurance isn't going to pay any of it. So I just don't. And how many people are like that in the U.S. or don't have insurance at all? Uh, we're seeing, I'm seeing even just in Milwaukee County, a very clear correlation between race, uh, income, um, and, you know, uh, all of that. And surprisingly, you know, oh, if you don't have really good health insurance, and now the c cases are just ballooning in those areas, and it's really scary. It is. This is one thing that um, obviously it's very foreign to me, the, the concept of not having a public uh, health system uh, as a European as a, and as an Italian, because uh, we take this so for granted. And I have to say, this is the second time in uh, a very short period of time in my life that I'm very thankful for that because my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer two years ago and she got exceptional treatment and she didn't pay a dime um you know they even gave her um 
So all, all, all the treatment was free and all the medicines and they even gave her this parking for free for when she went to do the chemo. And, you know, now with this in Italy, I know that, God forbid, someone needs to go to the hospital and get intubated and everything. It's not going to cost us anything. And... And uh, the medical staff are really doing exceptional work with not the best of situation because at the same time, we do have the public health system, but not all hospitals are equipped. Not everyone received everything that they needed. So, for example, my region, uh, we're supposed now all to wear masks, but we cannot find masks in shops. So luckily for me, SideGround sent me from Bulgaria 10 masks, 10 reusable masks. So, you know, I gave them to my dad, my mom, my son, my ex-husband, my boyfriend. I just sent them out to everyone. But, you know, we... we so... So, I don't know. It's... Uh, it's it, Obviously, it's a very complicated issue and it's something that even countries that have public health and had some form of um, preparation for this are not really prepared for the scale of this. So this is this is very worrisome everywhere. And Italy is kind of a big country. We are 60 million people. So it's, it's a small but lots of people i see the same in the uk my boyfriend lives in the uk and they also first of all they underestimated the situation in the beginning like i think the like i think we all did let's face it because you know it's it's easy to say oh boris johnson said that we all should get uh, sick so we develop herd immunity but it's Two weeks before, the mayor of Milano was uh, posting stuff like, uh, Milano doesn't stop. And that's when the shit hit the fan, because everyone was going out. And I was like, Milano doesn't stop. We're going to go and have our aperitivo. We're going to go to work. And then, oh, my God, Lombardia, which is the region of Milano, everyone is sick. And I was like, oh, duh, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of... I think everyone is becoming an expert in hindsight. So it's like, oh yeah, I told you so, but would it absolutely the same? Would it absolutely the same thing in Italy? I completely underestimated this. This is something that it, it was, you know, a time in my life where I really had to come face to face with my ignorance. <laughs> and when it was just in China and my prejudice and, whatever because when it was in china it was only in china and then it started spreading to asia and work in asia was supposed to happen and they cancel work in asia and i was like why there are only five cases and i'm in italy and what's gonna happen to me and remember and two weeks later i'm like with a mask and gloves whenever i need to go and take the post and i'm like oh i'm gonna die and and this is also something incredible to witness like how our perception of this thing is actually hitting us just when it's really close to us <laughs> and I don't know it's, it is a weird weird time <laughs> I have really it's I found it interesting watching everybody kind of come to the realization of of how bad it is like ours was um in middle of March we had spring break planned and um, I went from, oh, I'm still going to Florida to two days later, like panic shopping and buying food for my freezer. Um, and I had other friends that were like, I'm still going to Florida. What's wrong with you? And then, you know, a couple of days later, they were doing the same thing. Yes, that that was exactly the same with work in Asia. You know, like people were like, oh, even if it's canceled, I'm going to go to Asia anyway because I paid my, for my ticket. And they were like, no, no. I'm not going to do that. And it's the same with Italy. I, I was in... Uh, I was in the UK at the end of uh, February. So the day I flew, I stayed there for a week. The day I flew out, everything was kind of normal. The authority was telling us to use masks only if we were infected. Uh, 
So I went to the hospital, uh, I went to the, the airport and I saw a lot of people with masks and I tweeted out something like, oh, I so want to ask them if they're infected because they can, you know, it was clear that we need to put this only if we're, if we're infected and everything. One week later, I'm on the plane from London to Turin. You know, I'm wearing a mask, I'm cleaning the seat around me and that's when I really hit me how serious it was. I got to my air, I got to Turino, to the airport Airport, and the Red Cross was there taking temperature for everyone and there was an isolation tent so if you had a fever for any reason in the world you were put in quarantine directly and I'm like oh shit <laughs> this is real unfortunately pandemics are a little hobby of mine and so I saw it coming in January and then I tweeted all right Facebook post in February like third week of February hey everyone needs to be prepared to spend several weeks isolated at home. And my friends are like, what are you talking about? This isn't worse than the flu. And I'm like, no, it's coming. And you need to shop and you need to be at home now. <laughs> Several weeks would be lucky at this point. I think it's going to be a year. We've, we've been extended to after like end of May for us. That's what adjusted for me is I realized this is an 18 month process that there was no hiding uh, so in terms of what is going to happen, we're kind of living day by day. So they keep pushing the deadline for the reopening. And it's and that is actually the thing that I really makes me anxious, very anxious, is not knowing when this is going to end. Like if you tell me now you have to do this for two years, I'm like, all right, I can take it. It's two years. There's a deadline. I'm going to organize my life through this. but. What really is causing me major anxiety, now a little bit less because I think we're transitioning in a new normal. So we're now more accepting of what is happening. But the first two weeks when, when I really realized what was happening, I was like, you know, I have to change my whole life. And my, my, so my boyfriend lives in the UK, so I haven't seen him in six weeks and I don't know when I'm going to see him. My dad doesn't live in my, my city, so I also... I haven't seen him, I don't know, because when I left for London at the end of February, I've already haven't seen him for a couple of weeks. So it's now over two months and I don't know where I'm going to see him. And the schools, it was just a disaster. Uh, so they, you know, they closed the school for three days. Then they extended it for a week. Then they extended it for two weeks. Now there is no date. And kids are home uh they closed parks which is very hard i don't know if i was cut off before or yeah, no, they cut they, they cut out they they also closed the parks here too just recently too yeah yeah and we and we yeah we heard that that part in your your poor kid like i just especially if you're in a space where you don't have your own backyard or you know what I mean, like a garden space or something where they can just go out and let off some steam. That must be so hard. That is very hard. That is very hard. And, um, and it's also where, and I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in Italy, we're very much about interpreting things. So the, the government issued this decree that um, we cannot live unless you know we have to go to the supermarket or stuff like that we cannot leave the house and go farther than 200 meters which i have no idea what it is in feet probably no i don't know anyway we'll figure it out and so but it's basically a block of a small city not of new york right so <laughs> So I'm like, okay, does this mean that I can go downstairs with my kid once a day and go back and forth in the block just so he can, you know, move his leg and I can move my leg or, or not? So these things are very unclear. So this is where people interpret. Either they go out and they're like, I mean, I'm not going to stay put for such a long time. And there are people like us, which has been staying indoor for six weeks now and go out to once like I am now at this stage where I'm became a master meal planner and meal prepper and I have a super good system for shopping 
So I think I will be able to go two weeks without going out. But do I want to go two weeks without going out? Like, you know, it's so, yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't know. You know, and I had a very similar, that whole open-endedness of it is where I really kind of just, it hit me the hardest. Um, and, you know, I have, you know, I have a yard, I have a uh, space and, you know, to, to move around, but I have no people to interact with. Um, literally no one, just me and my cat. And so that was, you know, that, that's been hard. I mean, that's hard. Mental health is hard when you work remotely anyway. Um, but they work, you recommend you have some sort of interaction and now you're like, well, no, no more interaction. Um, but, and one of the things that, you know, we've been, at least in Milwaukee is like, well, what about all the small businesses? I love to hear like, how, it, how are the small businesses and such um, in Italy, like surviving, um, or doing for these things this time? It's very different and it depends what's your business. So anyone that had an opportunity to translate their business somehow online is doing it. Um, I am very proud to say this and I'm not, I'm not giving you a sales speech, but I really think Cygrant did something really great here. Uh, since the very beginning, we gave a, a very, very massive discount to Italy, uh, to clients that were coming from Italy and from Spain, like a dollar for three months of hosting, because we thought that people will need to go online and they will need to go online quickly and they don't have the cash flow right now to commit to a 300 euros a year uh, hosting plan or, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that's, for example, one, and we started doing webinars and we started writing articles and we're not the only host who did this. Obviously, a lot of hosts, and I, I really like seeing this, how it's going in the industry right now that, Anyone that has a way to help is doing it by uh, giving, you know, producing content, uh, opening uh, office hours, uh, giving discounts and stuff like that. So I think everyone that has had any chance to transform their business and pivot quite quickly, they did it. Others cannot. So all businesses are closed except for the prim primary necessities. Pri pri Essential, mm -hmm. essential, essential, essential services. Yes. Do you have restaurants? Can they? Can restaurants do takeout or delivery or no? They can do. They can do only delivery. They cannot do takeout. Uh, bars were um, okay. What we call bar, you call a cafe. So cafes were uh, were closed. Uh, were the first to be closed. Um, clothing shops. So if I go, I live in this uh, neighborhood, which is um, which is kind of a an old school, um, not low class but working class um italy very much working class italy but like uh, you know people that were working in the fiat factories in the 50s so it's full of shops and it's full of people it's very it's very very lively and there is this a stretch of a road again probably 200 300 meters i don't know that's full of small shops so there's a um, uh, there's uh, two butchers, there's, uh, I don't know, like uh, three bakeries and uh, the makeup shop. And then there's uh, um, two ladies that sells, uh, oof, this word is so difficult, haberdashery, I think you say this. Uh, like hats stuff. and stuff, yeah. Uh, the, haberdashery, like Oh, so the sewing supplies and things like that? Sewing supplies and stuff like that. So, you know, so basically they all shut down except for the butcher, the bakers and the supermarkets. Everyone else has shut down. So we have a system in Italy where um, certain um, industries can get, uh, if you are product production, factory of some form even if you're like my ex-husband is um he's a pasta maker 
he works in this small shop where they make fresh pasta every day and they um, they sell the pasta, but they also have a small restaurant. So they closed for a while and the, and the, the state is paying 80% of your salary. Uh, there's a special fund for that, which is like an empl- unemployment, but not really because you keep being employed by your employer, but you get your salary through the state and you get 80% of that. Um, now they are reopening this week and they will only do uh, delivery. You can, takeout is also not very common in Italy. We do we either sit at a restaurant or we do delivery. Takeout is not so common. Uh, delivery has been working very well. A lot of all the Uber Eats, uh, Just Eat, the delivery, all these companies are um, you know, they lowered the rates for delivery. Uh, they made sure to give to all the couriers uh, gloves uh, and masks uh, and stuff like that. Um, so it really depends. But there are a lot of people who are losing losing their jobs and uh, you know their their livelihood because their uh, their company doesn't have the cash flow to pay them, and they are not in one of those. Um, industries where they can get the salary paid by the state for this period so those businesses are struggling and they're closing i read so last week they uh, they showed them um, the numbers of uh, china uh, national oh i don't know all those words in english uh, how you call the national uh, production income and stuff like that under that like they're like down a nine percent of their economy or and I think the same is happening here. So it's 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 gonna have a very long tail. I mean even if in my, in May they say that in May, at the beginning of May, they will uh, loosen up a little bit of the of the restrictions. But Obviously, it's not going to go, hey, let's go party in the street <laughs> on the May 3rd. For example, schools, it's almost certain that they will. So in, in Italy, kids go to school until mid-June, and then they go back in mid-September. We have a three-month uh, holiday. And um, so it's basically for sure that they're not going to back, go back to school this year. And also in September, probably when they're going to start, they're not going to start 100% in class, but they will probably do a mix of online and in person and, you know, maybe have an, um, a ninth grade to go on Mondays, 10th grade go on Tuesday and stuff like that. So Yeah, I think they, I think they closed schools completely here for the rest of the, the year. And, but for Wisconsin, I don't know if this is everywhere else, um, liquor stores are an essential service, so they're still open. Oh. So. I think it is essential. I am drinking tea because I also have to uh, record a session for work in Santa Clarita after, <laughs> but normally at this time I would be drinking a gin and tonic. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, that sounds delicious. I'm gonna, as soon as we're done with this, I'm gonna go have a cocktail. Um, Wow. It's been so interesting to talk to you about everything from, you know, WordPress contributing to um, life in Italy under coronavirus. Um, Before we go, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Mostly on Twitter. Uh, So I'll be honest that I'm not going, I'm not very present on social media right now because it's causing me major anxiety and uh, I don't really need that. (laughs) But occasionally you will find me on Twitter as Francesca Marano, at Francesca Marano. And uh, and you can find me on the SiteGround blog uh, in English because my blog is only in Italian, so I don't think it's very interesting. (laughs) Also, I'm a terrible blogger. I never write. So if you want to chat with me would definitely be Twitter or on Slack. I'm uh, Francina, which is S R A N C I N A. Say Francina. And we will put all of that in the show notes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or join our Facebook group not already subscribed? Well, you can find us on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and iTunes. 
did you know that you could help support the Women in WP podcast? If you head on over to our Patreon page, you'll find additional content and some cool perks if you want to set up a monthly donation of a dollar or more. And finally, you can find all show notes, links, and transcriptions at our website at womeninwp.com. Until next time...